Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, thanks to the API Days team for putting on such an awesome event. I really like this platform. Um, we're all in virtual conference mode, so there, you know we get a couple of hiccups here and there, but phenomenal job putting this together. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about business models, which you know don't get too excited. Um, you know, more and more as I've dug into the API space, and as many alluded to, I've had a background where I've gone from building uh, soap services on HP nonstop computers to um, working in enterprise architecture bank to working on the software vendor side and the technical roles, architectural roles. You know, my main focus lately has been around business strategy related to APIs, and I think it's a really Good, it's really good timing for that. It's good timing for everyone to be thinking about APIs from a business strategy perspective, because we are making this massive shift to a digital economy out of the industrial economy. And I think that the people probably can learn the technology a little more easily than they can learn this whole new way of doing digital business. And certainly current uh, uh, pandemic circumstances have forced the uh, digital issue even more. So what I wanna to talk to you about today is really a, a, an approach to how you can think about your business, think about your digital business and construct business models that will help you build thriving ecosystems for APIs and really for your overall digital business. So I'm, I work for MuleSoft as the global leader of API strategy. And we put out a survey every year where we work with um, leaders across our customer base, across the industry on, um, trends that they're seeing around integration. And so we we have a lot of lenses we put this through, but um, the, the we did a big focus this year on really drilling into API strategy as well as business benefits. And I think that, you know, I find that uh, these are really interesting results because we've been talking for a decade or more now on, you know, all the promise of APIs, you know, APIs can can make freshly squeezed orange juice if you want them to, right? Like there's all these things that we've been talking about for so long. We're now seeing a critical mass of organizations taking advantage of these. And here's just a, you know, the, the survey results where, you know, companies we're working with leveraging APIs, they're seeing productivity gains, they're seeing increased innovation. Those are maybe a little less concrete to measure but you can read the list here. But I found the most interesting thing is that 31% of the companies we talked to have, have actually experienced revenue growth as a result of APIs. Um, and even though that's the smallest number on the, on the survey results, to me, it's the most profound one. Because if you can tie the usage of APIs back to driving revenue for your organization, I mean, that's a massive business outcome. So how are they doing that? I, you know, I think it does come down to where your APIs fit in your overall business model. And as we'll see, there are different ways of, of constructing business models, different patterns of business models. But the first thing to know is that you really need to be thinking about where your APIs fit in your business model. So I think everyone who's been in the industry for a while knows that the, uh, you know, the authoritative work on business models was done by John Musser. Uh, he, he founded Programmable Web back in 2005. Uh, did a did a landmark presentation at the API Strat conference in 2013. We said called it 20 models in 20 minutes. You know, here are 20 patterns of API business models. And the way he kind of created this taxonomy of business models was to think about the perspective of of where money was flowing. Some cases you had free APIs. Some cases uh, developers would be paying. You know, you, and this is the probably the, the stereotype where companies are thinking about opening up their APIs, charging money for it, collecting new revenue streams. There's other business models where a developer might get paid um, in, in, if you're exposing you know, services through APIs that are gonna drive transactions that generate revenue for a company, you might get a slice of those transactions. And then lots of different indirect models where it might not be so obvious how money is being exchanged. And this is still, an awesome uh, presentation to review, and there's lots of great examples that are cited there. So, you know, I think this is a, a great way of looking at business models. But as I got into researching business models and how things could, you know, how really what I wanted to do is come up with an approach that would allow companies to get hands on and really understand their own business models, as well as identify new opportunities and even assess 
API opportunities for how valuable they'll be to the overall business. And that's where the word value really comes up. So for a while, you know, I've been following Alex Osterwalder. He's the creator of the Business Model Canvas, which has been a very useful tool. Um, I've been using Business Model Canvas, uh, just straight up the Business Model Canvas to help companies identify API product opportunities. It's a great way of fleshing out the overall API ecosystem. But going back to how he defines a business model, it's all about creating, delivering, and capturing value. And in that case, value isn't necessarily um, a monetary value, right? This is really any sort of value that you could deliver. And as we move into this digital economy, as we'll see, there's lots of different ways of exchanging value that aren't necessarily about money. So, so maybe business models are really about value. Um, going into Clayton Christensen, um, if you were attending Iraqli's presentation earlier, he referenced Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen is the author of the Innovator's Dilemma and the Innovator's Solution, landmark uh, thinker in the, in the business world, especially in terms of deconstructing uh, the business landscape and giving very st strong lessons for this highly disruptive digital economy that we're in. But there's a concept that's fundamental to the innovator's dilemma uh, that he calls the value network. And it's really a way of looking at a business landscape and the interdependencies between all the entities in a business landscape. So if you're a company and you wanna look at what your value network is, you have to consider who your customers are, who all the suppliers are in delivering products and services to your customers. And what you find in a value network is that there are there's really an interconnected set of business models. So you might have retailers and wholesalers working together to fulfill customers' shopping needs, so on. So this idea of a value network and thinking about a topology of uh, entities that are exchanging value in different ways to ultimately fulfill consumer need I think is a very powerful way of looking at the digital economy. And if you think about how the, the, the different interactions in that value network between the nodes, you can look at those as, as value exchange and you know interfaces very much in the digital sense leads us to APIs. But this, I, you know, what, what actually started me on this path was a, a book that I'd read, great uh, product management book by Melissa Perry called Escaping the Build Trap. And she really opens the book um, goes into phenomenal detail and a whole other topic area of, of product management, but starts it off by always considering what is your value exchange? What are the products or services you're offering to customers that fulfill, solve their problems and fulfill their wants and needs for which they're willing to exchange money, right? And, and with all this in mind, thinking about value networks, thinking about value exchange, and then thinking about the idea of delivering, capturing, and creating value, wanted to apply this into the API space. But first we can, you know, just to get familiar with the, how you might construct a value exchange based business model, here's the retailer wholesaler model, right? How does this all work? Well, shoppers want goods. And so they go to a retailer to get their products and they're gonna buy them there. Now, theoretically, they could go to all the different wholesalers, all the different product suppliers and get their products, but the retailer adds value on top of those products by providing one place to go uh, pro by providing targeted products. You know, you might go to a grocery store for food. You might go to a home improvement store if you're working on house projects. So, so what is the retailer doing that they're going to charge a premium on the products? They're providing, they're adding value by consolidating the, the store, consolidating the products, giving selection to the shoppers who can go to one place and get what they need. A more sophisticated business model we might look at we could look back at the print media newspaper model where, and, and there's still a lot of newspapers have kind of adopt, ad adapted this to the digital space where readers want news and they, you know, for certain content, they're willing to pay money for it. At the same time, product companies want to advertise in media. And so they're willing to pay the newspaper as well. Um, and at the same time, newspapers have their own writers, but they may be hiring freelance journalists to, to, to create content. So here, we're seeing different types of value being exchanged, content. Um, exposure is a, an interesting value proposition here where that's really what the newspaper is providing to the product companies access to, a, to an audience. And I think where, where this really becomes interesting is, is if we juxtapose that media model against Facebook. 
right? Why has Facebook been so disruptive in the media space? Well, they're offering this, the content without charging for it, right? Not only that, they're giving a path for users to provide content. And a lot of the content that people are going to social media for is content about their friends and connections lives. And they are still getting third parties who are supplying um, supplying games and, and other apps that maybe they're exchanging money for. But the big value proposition here, and the reason Facebook has gone from having no business model to being multi-business, multi-million dollar of revenue every year is the precision of targeting on advertising that they're offering. I know we're in an interesting time now where a lot of retailers or a lot of product companies are actually at this moment boycotting uh, Facebook, but that's a whole other story. But the fact remains, the precision of their, their ad targeting based on the content and data that they're collecting from users is really driving their business model. So rather than look at just pricing schemes and you know maybe looking at a one pager, if we start to build a map, a topology for how these businesses are constructed by looking at the different exchanges of value between all the entities in this value network, it can become a pretty powerful tool for breaking down how you can drive value through your APIs. Now, just on the topic of these business models, um, through this whole research uh, process, I actually came across a, a company based in the Netherlands, here are the two founders, uh, who are using this approach, breaking down business models through value exchange, and they did a very deep dive on Facebook. They've done Netflix, and they've got a, a whole bunch of other uh, examples that they worked through. So I. You know, if you want to dig deeper on this, it's it's really profound stuff. Getting into not only these more party to you know third party exchanges of value, but digging into the the underpinnings and the and the uh, the infrastructure provision and so on that goes into business models as well. So a good follow up read. But let's pivot now to talk about APIs. I think it's fair to say that a stereotypical API value exchange would look something like this. We've got an API provider and they're offering some sort of service to a set of consumers, usually those consumers are the ones who are actually building the systems of experience, the mobile apps, the web apps that are going to be exposed to end users. There's lots of different value though that can be exchanged. And I think if we look back at the Melissa Perry example, you know, she was talking about products and services being exchanged for money. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, I would say that's the, um, the manufacturing, the 20th century value exchange in most business models. What, what's really interesting now, I think, is what we can do with data. So in the Facebook example, we saw Facebook's, what they're collecting from users, aside from content, is lots of data that they're using to correlate the, the user's relationships, interests, and then feeding that into their ad targeting, right? So, uh, and we can look at Google, we can look at Netflix recommendations and Amazon recommendations, all the big digital players who are, who are really driving the digital economy are experts at capturing data as value and then creating value through that data for other exchanges and their value networks. But I think even that one might be a little bit obvious for people in the digital space. There's lots of stuff and, and lots of great work that can be done on understanding how data can create value. But there are, other, there are other types of value that you can create. And I think this is where we get into some uniqueness around APIs, because the types of consumers that you're going to have for APIs are developers, right? A lot of the work being done to build solutions that are using APIs done by developers. So on one hand, we, we saw the example of exposure as being getting access to an audience uh, as, as a value proposition that can be given kind of on the back end. But at the same time, there's a big value proposition around time. And, and so let's go into some examples where I, I like to call these value currencies. Um, this is kind of a way of, of really getting into how you can uh, drive, drive uh, value in your API business models. So here's a pattern that I'll call the API supplier business model. And the example we're going to use is Google Maps, right? So Google Maps has a very, um, has been in the in the game for quite a while. You know, it's been an API for web API for uh, almost you know the history of the uh, web API, the API economy. Um, 
you've got best of breed functionality, unique data that Google is able to go out and offer for a premium. So people are happy to come up and, and there's lots of examples of, of applications that have been built on top of Google Maps API. Uh, we'll see some of those. But the, the interesting thing here is I think Google is able to both charge money for the use of their API, which is then being used to provide location enabled services to end users. But at the same time, they're able to collect all the information about who's making the call, what are they looking for? And again, factoring that in, into their data analysis, which is then used for their ad targeting. So they're actually creating one value network around providing location services, but then they're extracting data from that value network and injecting it into their advertising value network. So even though this is a very simple example on the surface, you can see where uh, if you really drill down on the thinking, you can get even deeper value. Now, here's a pattern that I, that I really like because I think it's an eye opener for a lot of companies that are just getting into the digital space and especially into the API space. Twilio has been a phenomenal success story in the API economy for a long time. They, they tick all the boxes on, on how, to be, how, to, how to be a strong API product company. They have a very specific targeted set of services around communication APIs that can be built into applications um, they started out just following the, the App Store launch from Apple and really helped a lot of developers take advantage of all the facilities on the iPhone and, and built up their business to now they're uh, you know, a billion dollar publicly traded company. But they also spent a ton of time catering their services for developers to make it easy for developers to sign up, make it easier for developers to build those solutions and reducing all the friction and getting developers on board. But if you look at what they're doing, they're really taking a set of backend telco APIs and offering those in, in a consolidated form and in a very developer friendly form. So this is very much like that retailer wholesaler model that we saw earlier. What Twilio is effectively doing is curating all these different telco APIs, providing global service based on the number of, of communication uh, backend services they offer and then catering that to their consumers, the developers who are going to be building solutions with that. So I call this the API retailer business model because they're actually acting much like a retailer would with goods in the, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the bricks and mortar retailer industry. Here, they're retailing communication services. And this is a pattern I think that shows you just by taking, just by creating value through time to market, right? Time to market by giving app developers one place to go to get all their communication services, as well as giving time to market by making it easier for developers to build applications. That's a huge value proposition that's allowed them to charge a premium on top of the services they're using at the back end. Now, just one more archetype of business model here is, you know, the industry sort of calls this in the, at least in the business model industry, they call this the aggregator business model. It's really a two-sided marketplace model, but let's look at what Airbnb is doing, right? Or, or Uber or Lyft and so on. A lot of these places where you've got, um, you're generating a two-sided marketplace of suppliers and consumers. Here, um, again, Airbnb is able to build momentum up as they get more listings, as they get more scale, they're actually offering a marketplace for property owners to list their properties, which you know, they're, they're going to get that content. Essentially, that's inventory for their marketplace in exchange for exposure initially. And ultimately, when, when renters uh, book the properties, they're going to exchange money, but they're going to actually control the transaction. And, and for the renters and the consumers, they're offering an aggregated marketplace, one place to go where you can find all the properties. And again, you're going to, the value they get is as they build up their scale of having a large audience to appeal to, then that's gonna make it more appealing for property owners. So this is really a, a flywheel or, or a momentum based business model where the more property owners listing and the more renters, it just, it just builds momentum. But from, um, from an API perspective here, this really allows Airbnb to offer its services, not just through its own applications, but to connect into places like multiple listing services for property owners, as well as getting to other digital channels for, for captive audience on the other side. 
so just with the you know the amount of time I've had, um, it's uh, it's we're not there's there's some other maybe more complex examples that we can go into, um, and I think this is a really exciting. We're just scratching the surface here, but I think what what's really interesting about all this is we've been talking about this notion of API ecosystems for a long time, and trying to figure out how we define API ecosystems, and you know a big part of the guidance that I give to companies when working with them on business strategy is to really think through your ecosystem. I think what this does is shows that API ecosystems are, are essentially the value network for APIs. And if we think about things in that term, in those terms, we can then consider all the different touch points we have in the ecosystem and consider what type of value we're adding to all the different entities in there. So there is a lot more to dig into. I, I recently wrote a blog on this. Uh, Mike Amundsen and I did a podcast uh, uh, to, to get into the to details of this. If you want to look into the value engineers, the, the group in the Netherlands that I mentioned, I, I included the link here. But also, um, MuleSoft, we've developed a set of, of API program workshops to really help engage with organizations on their API strategies. We have a whole API as a product workshop, and this value exchange business model thinking is a big part of that. So you can check out the Strategy Hub or go visit our MuleSoft booth during the break. But uh, thanks, everyone. And I think I had left a bit of time for questions. Yes, yes, for sure. And uh, we have a first question. Uh, uh, what will you need to telcos is what Stripe did to pay many APIs. Do you agree with that? I completely agree. Those are the two big retailer models that I would cite. Um, and, I uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I think that as we get into um, as we get into other industries, like open banking is, is taking off. Uh, and even insurance, like where you see lots of quotes and so on, I think there's there. I think I think that every industry there may be a retailer type opportunity here as as digital services mature. Yeah, and I know Impala is trying to do that for hotels, and uh, Play actually was doing that for banking. Uh, one question about the, uh, how free is important in value exchange, and how to engage your company into free, uh, let's say, API consumptions. Being able to collect data or you know like uh, specific assets that will make you a winner at the end. So you know this is something I could I could talk for another half an hour on. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's there's the the pure business argument and then there's the moral argument, right? So uh, I think that I, I think one thing to consider is business models are really something that you want to achieve at steady state. So don't assume that you can just introduce a business model and have all your value exchanges functioning the way you want day one, there may be things you want to do to prime the business model. Like if you're doing a two-sided marketplace, maybe you're going to offer stuff for free up front that you wouldn't later on, right? You might you might move towards a, um, a charging approach. But I think, I think on the moral side, like transparency is key here. So you're, you know, I think there's a reason Facebook is getting into so much trouble uh, with with boycotts happening right now, there's a there's a general feeling of uh, you know maybe not trans not transparency happening there. Um, so so I think I think it actually helps to to say look here's the value exchange because what this allows you to do is design win win models. I, I was actually to take the ecosystem thing even further. Like um, you can think some startups are going to act like invasive species. In an ecosystem, right, where you get some species that evolved in another place, and then they come into this and they just kill everything, including themselves, right? It's like the kind of like the Napster Napster model, where they kind of came in and destroyed the music industry, and then they destroyed themselves, and then we, you know, we, this this other ecosystem evolved on top of it. But so I think that um, the more transparency you have, the more you define win-win, the more successful you'll be in a sustainable way, because. If you help the value network thrive, you're going to help your business thrive. If you're too extractive, if you take too much value for yourself, then you may just kill the whole value network. Yeah, often what I say, some entrepreneurs are okay to earn millions uh, while they're killing billions, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Matt. I think, uh, yeah, uh, you already received some congratulations on the... Uh, okay. on the on the thing and yes uh, so i think we can find you at mulesoft booth or you know talk about the different workshops yeah uh, i've got a round table tomorrow and a i'll be at the booth mike amundsen and i'll be at the booth tomorrow as well so but 
thank you, many, this great event and uh, looking forward to all the other sessions.